and now <laughs> comes the fun part, Fourier yeah, space. Exactly. Yeah. So. so what is Fourier space? Um, so I guess for many people here, this is the boring part, and I'll just try to uh, skip through this uh, over the next 40 minutes or so. This is the important part. So I think most of you probably know this. What we cannot afford is not to know this. Yeah? Um, for everything that will come in the next week, you will all need to know what Fourier space is. And just to make sure that we all do that, I want to introduce this now. So Fourier, Jean-Baptiste uh, Joseph Fourier was a French mathematician. And he um, came up with this equation uh, about 200 years before the computers were invented. Yeah? or at least 150 years before that. That's what I find interesting. Yeah? So that the real application for his invention uh, came only much later. It's a mathematical equation where you have some function that defines your signal. In our case, it's a 2D picture or the crystal or so. And it's multiplied with an exponential of something imaginary. Um, with the Gaussian equation, this is a combination of cosinus and sinus functions. Um, at different frequencies u, and this is in an integral um, over the entire space, and then gives you um, the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform is then um, a mathematical function that is complex valued. We have real and imaginary components um, in Fourier space. And if you take the modulus of this and square it, that's the power spectrum. And the power spectrum is comparable to the electron diffraction pattern. Um, that's the mathematical way to describe this. The direct way would be the following. Um, so we have real space. And in real space, um, we have a the picture and the picture um, has dimensions in tungstens or nanometers, so I call this x is my horizontal coordinate. And then we have the gray value, which is um, white or black. Um, I call this f of x. That's our image. And the picture can be white, it can be black, it can be white, it can be black, it can be white, it can be black. Yeah, that's our picture. Um, the gray value. And then if you put this function f into the Fourier transform equation, ft, you go to Fourier space. And in Fourier space, you are in frequency units. Um, in this case, if this is nanometers, then in frequency units, you would be 1 over nanometer, reciprocal dimension. And here we have the um, Fourier transform of u. It's a complex-valued function. Here in real space, we can define a wavelength um, or the length of our periodic um, structure, and I call this, just to confuse you, I call this, should I call this lambda? I call this D, yeah? Because lambda is the wavelength of the electron microscope, so I call this D. And then here in, at the frequency 1 over D, we have a peak, or actually just one line, yeah? So, and this is one peak in the Fourier space there. And this peak then has an amplitude um, of 100, for example, which means the amplitude here is, for example, 100 between black and white. And we have a phase value. And the phase value is, in this case, 0 degrees, which means the cosinus wave started on the left. It's a cosinus wave. If it starts here on the top, then it's a 0 degree phase. If I would uh, take this here and shift it, um, for example, to this wave, and this is again x, this is the small f on x, and if it's shifted, then the Fourier transformation would look the same, same frequency, same amplitude, 100, but the phase now is shifted by 90 degrees. This moves there, um, so, or is it minus 90? I don't know. So now I call this 90 degree phase. So the Fourier transformation is a complex valued um, function that gives us an amplitude and a phase. Um, there's also something about the frequency, which we sh I can show you here. 
Um, how do I do this? Uh, switch over to a little program that is called an idea. Um, and here I have an oscilloscope and a spectrum, and it's a Fourier transform thing. So here on the left, we see the, what the microphone picks up, and this here is the Fourier transform, and it shows you low frequencies and high frequencies. And if I uh, am stupid and sing, then you have um, a basic frequency, right? And um, usually it should give some sinus wave, and then you would see the first order um, sound here. And now, if I go back to this, um, can I do that? Where is this? Here. So what I did now is... Um, if you sing one U sound, it's a sinus wave, and you have one basic frequency. And if you then... Um, do not make U, but U, B, e, O, E. So this is U, E. Yeah? Then you have some higher frequencies. And the higher frequency is here. There's actually the basic frequency, the first order. Then there's the second order, third order, fourth order, fifth, sixth. And the seventh order is high again. And this is this little bump here on the top. And if this now would be a protein, then this would be a protein that already shows you three alpha helices. Yeah, because you have higher resolution details. And the higher resolution details are in the higher orders in your refraction. Yeah, so basic frequency is always here. Um, then this is our um, unit cell. And this corresponds to D. And this would be 1 over D as frequency. And here we also have the unit cell. And this is the basic frequency. Um, then we can modify the amplitude and do something loud or not so loud. This is whoo, and this is whoo. Yeah? And um, it's the same basic frequency, and therefore the peak is on the same position, um, but the amplitude is very high here and not so high here. Even So this is automatically scaling, but this here is higher than this one. Yeah? So the amplitude in Fourier space um, is how loud this is or how much contrast is in your picture. Then we have some higher order frequencies here. Um, and then we can change the, um, the frequency and do Oh, well, this is not so. So what you would have to watch is that the basic frequency is moving right and left. Yeah, That goes to higher frequency and smaller. This is when the wavelength here is... Um, uh, where is this? So, um, this, this now is, um, is that already? Yeah, I think so. This is the, the count I had before, with the basic unit cell there, and the first order here, and then some higher order refractions. And this now is a bigger unit cell, and the first order is much at much uh, lower frequency. Yeah? This is the reciprocity. So if we have a large unit cell, then the first order is very close to the origin of the Fourier transformation. And here this unit cell would be a protein structure that shows some small details in there. And so you have um, first order, second, third, fourth, and so on. So this would be the, the version of Fourier space. Um, so now here, what we deal with in electron microscopy is not graphs, but we have um, pictures. Yeah, and the pictures we have our our lines like this, for example, um, and our pictures have x and y coordinates. And the Fourier transformation of this would give a Fourier space. And the Fourier space has the frequency in the horizontal direction called u and the frequency in the vertical direction called V, and in the third dimension here, we have the gray value between white and black, and this can be called F from X and Y, and here in the third direction, we have now the Fourier transformation, and that's called F of U comma V. And now if in this image we just have a sinusoidal wave 
from top left to bottom right, then here um, this would be the distance between the waves, yeah? and here in this direction at a radial distance here of 1 over d, you would have one big peak, and the peak comes out of the blackboard. And this peak here would have an amplitude of, I don't know how much contrast we have there, for example 70, and the phase of, if this starts in the top left corner, then the phase is zero degrees. Yeah. So, but if um, this whole line would start a little bit later, so not in the top left corner, but shifted, like here, then we would have a different phase of 90 or 280 degrees or so. Yeah. So shifting an image in Fourier space means the phases change a bit. And this direction here is the same direction as orthogonal to this, these lines. Um, but if you go in that direction, you also see lines. Yeah? And that means we also would expect here a diffraction spot. And this is called Friedel symmetry. In Fourier space, you have everything you have on the right half. You also have on the left half. The only difference is that the phases are complex conjugated on the left side towards the right side, um, which means 180 is added. So if this would be 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, and you can number the pixels from 0 to 999 in computer language, then you would have one megabyte of data if one pixel is one byte. In Fourier space now, this would be 512 by 512, um, or you can, so from 0 to 512, um, the total width would be also 1025 by 1000. 1,025 pixels, yeah. Um, each pixel is a complex number, amplitude and phase. That would be two megabyte. But for information theory, you should have the same amount of kilobytes needed to store this and to store that. So um, these two megabytes, half of them you can already save on your hard drive because the left half and the right half are symmetric. And so we only always save only the right half of your Toya space. Then we are about down to about one megabyte, but there's still a difference. That is, the Fourier space starts at zero and goes to 512, um, which is one line more than here. So that means the first line here, we only save this vertical direction and, and not, not this line. Yeah. So now, the amount of kilobyte is that we need to go from 0 to 512 only for this line, but not for that, because this line and that line is again the same for symmetry reasons. And now this is still more than that. Now this is exactly 1k by 1k, and this here is, for this stretch is too much in kilobytes. So why do we need this kilobytes to save the same information? Yeah? Um, and the reason is that the last line is restricted only to real values and not complex values. And that's where, you, if you would be extremely um, picky, you would not have to store the imaginary values of this last line, because that has to be a real pixel, but that's a detail. So in the end, the, the message is, whatever kilobytes you need to store your real space image, you would need, in theory, if you, I would say, if you have the complex values, the exact same amount of kilobytes in Fourier space save the same stuff in both worlds. The Fourier transformation mathematical formula can get us from here to there without any loss. And we can also go from here back to that with an inverse formula, which is called the Fourier transformation, the inverse one, minus one, three power minus one. So I'm trying to go a bit more. So now this is our image. We have a different image that shows um, so lines in this direction and then wider lines, for example, like, like this. Yeah. Then the Fourier transformation would show in this direction we have the distance d and it's very wide lines. That means here in Fourier space we have very close to the origin a big reflection, much closer than we had here. And also the Friedel symmetry related spot on the other side. 
which is not saved in the hard drive. Um, and it's closer to the origin in Fourier space, to the center, because this is wider. You could also say this is a low resolution detail that is at the center, and this is a higher resolution detail that is further away from the origin. Okay. And now if we have a picture that has very high resolution details in that direction, plus some lower resolution details in this direction, then your Fourier space would show you very high resolution spots here in this direction and low resolution spots here in that direction. Okay. So what is, what is interesting for us in Fourier space is the high resolution that is far out. <coughs> high resolution is always outside in Fourier space at the high frequencies. Um, and the low resolution is further on the inside. And if we have a picture that is covered by noise, yeah, as our pictures are always covered by noise, then also in Fourier space we have everything covered by noise. Yeah, so um, noise in real space is also noise in Fourier space. Um, what is interesting, however, is that the noise probably will only go out to a certain resolution and not higher. So if your Fourier transformation shows you data out to there in U and V direction, <coughs> if you have any bad noisy picture and you calculate the Fourier transformation, the first thing you can already see is the resolution of your picture, even though you initially see mostly noise. Yeah? But here, this is the highest resolution noise that you have, and that's at least something you can already see. Um, so this is how this would look in a, <coughs> in a real picture, even though this is a simulated one. Um, so this is a 2D crystal of aquaporins. Yeah? Um, atomic model projected here, but it doesn't matter. It's a 2D crystal. And then there's a gray area and a, and a hole, and this is the Fourier transform of this picture. Here we have units X and Y in nanometers, for example, and here we have frequency horizontal, we call that U, and frequency vertical, we call that V, and the, the, the units are 1 over nanometer, or 1 over angstroms, yeah, reciprocal units. And we have the low resolution stuff in the middle, and we have high resolution stuff on the outside. The lower resolution, the lowest resolution is the unit cell. So the unit cell is one protein and the next one, and that's cut out, and the next one. Yeah, so every two of these squares is one unit cell. So one unit cell is from here to there, that's one unit cell. And the first order diffraction would be here. It's hidden by this artifact here, but it should be here's the first order, second order, third order, fourth order. Something like that. So actually, first, second, third. This is the fourth order. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and so on. <coughs> so here we have. Um, I made the Photoshop some hole into the picture. Where is this hole in the Fourier space? It's everywhere. This information is everywhere, contributing to the background noise. This thing also is everywhere. Yeah, it has some low resolution component. It has some high resolution edge. It's com everywhere in the Fourier space. Yeah. Um, this unit cell periodicity here is in the first order. The fine alpha helical details of these proteins are in the higher orders. Um, so, in real space we have gray values, numbers between 0 and 255 if you use integer byte variables. In Fourier space you have complex values. Um, initially it's cosinus and sinus components, but they are usually um, presented as amplitudes and phases. I come to that later. So you have for every pixel here two variables in the computer, an amplitude and a phase. This peak here, this white peak, has a certain amplitude and the computer also knows the phase. Here it's only the amplitudes that are shown. I, I think it comes from this, oops, I think it comes from, from this thing. That, that may be actually the highly contrasted artifact in the middle. Where is 
before? Because this is squarish, I don't actually know. Usually you wouldn't have this. It's I made this in Photoshop and then calculated the Fourier transformation of this. So it may come from this hole, actually. If you do on an electron microscope a picture like this and calculate the Fourier transformation, then I think you have less of that. If you do electron diffraction on your crystal, then you have a big cloud of inelastically scattered low angle diffraction electrons that cover your CCD camera here. If you do physical electron diffraction in the electron microscope. Um, we go to lattice indexing in one of the practicals. Yeah? There is an algorithm to calculate a diffraction vector map among all these spots. And then you would find out that most of these spots are separated by this amount. But then you know that's where also the first order must be, even though I can't see it. Yeah, if you look at, there's an algorithm, you look at all the peaks and you calculate the difference vectors between all peaks with everybody. And that gives you this distance as the shortest one, then that's your first order. But we have that in the practical. At the moment I want to speak about amplitudes and phases, and you can ask the computer to plot those. This is a picture in nanometers and nanometers, for example, and this is the Fourier transformation displayed as amplitudes and phases. And usually we only look at the amplitudes, or sometimes the amplitudes squared, which is the intensities, and that's what we usually look at where we have the center, and then we have low-resolution stuff, and we have high-resolution stuff, and we just look at how strong are those frequencies, yeah, which is how strong are those frequencies. But this phase information, yeah, zero degree or 90 degree, yeah, is something that is, is not what you want to look at. This is how it would look like. So the phase between zero and 360 degrees is plotted here as gray values, Usually we can't even interpret this picture, yeah? so usually we don't look at that. But the computer has it, yeah? which is the difference to X-ray diffraction. The computer takes images and the Fourier transformation knows amplitudes and displays it, and also knows the phases, but um, we rarely look at that. And now if you, if you would take only the amplitudes and assume all phases to be just zero, then you have a picture that only has is composed of cosinus waves, and um, if you then do the inverse Fourier transformation, there should be a minus one. Then you end up with a picture that is um, the autocorrelation map of your image that should look roughly like this. Yeah? And this is the autocorrelation map of the image. You can obtain this by going to Fourier space, setting all phases to zero and going back to real space. And we will have the autocorrelation map also appear when it goes about lattice indexing. So the phases are more important for structural determination than the amplitudes. In this experiment here from the internet, somebody took a picture of a computer and a picture of a girl and calculated the Fourier transformations of both and then they took the amplitudes from this picture and they took the phase information from this picture and combined those in one Fourier transformation and then made the inverse Fourier transformation. And this is the resulting picture. This picture is composed of the phases from here and the amplitudes from there. And you almost nicely, quite nicely see the girl and not the computer. Yeah? And so when we try to determine the structure of a protein, the important thing is to get the phases right. And the amplitudes, if you want, you can, some, you can set them all to, to 1, or you can set them all to 100. That's not so important. Yeah. If we make mistakes in the amplitude uh, determination because our CTF correction didn't really hit the defocus on the spot, it's not that important as long as the phases are correct. Yeah. Then we get especially the high-resolution structures much better. That's the opposite to X-ray diffraction. In X-ray diffraction, you only have amplitudes and you try to get the phases from some tricks. Yeah, so um, anomalous diffraction or heavy metal soaking or, or so. Um, and then the, uh, the phases are of bad quality in an X-ray map. For electron microscopy, it's the opposite. The amplitudes are often of bad quality if they come from images because the defocus determination wasn't too precise, but the phases are often much of much better quality. Um, 
This slide explains the differences between high resolution and low resolution in Fourier space. This is a picture. I don't know if that's. Is that David Hills here? I don't know. When he was young. So you can go to Fourier space with the Fourier transformation and then with the inverse Fourier transformation back to real space, and you have your picture back. Now, in the second line of this slide, um, here in the Fourier transformation, the high resolution data on the outside were all deleted by setting their amplitudes all to zero. And only the low resolution data in the center were, were left in place. It's a low pass filter, low resolution only passes. And then if you do an inverse transformation, you see a picture that only shows you the blurry low resolution detail. And if you do the opposite and apply a high pass filter where only the high frequencies on the outside of the Fourier transformation survived, then you have all the high resolution components. Yeah, which is the edge and the hairs, the edge of the head, the hairs and the nose details. But the low resolution components like bright, black, bright, black, that's gone. If you now add these two together, the inner stuff plus the outer stuff, you have the exact Fourier transformation back. And if you add these two together, you also get the exact picture back. So this picture plus this picture gives you precisely this one as well as this Fourier transformation plus this one gives you precisely this one. Yeah? The Fourier transformation is linear. If you can add two pictures together, you can also add the two Fourier transformations together. These filters are called bandpass, where um, you only allow a certain frequency range to pass. Here only low resolution frequencies, um, and here only higher resolution frequencies, and this is how the corresponding picture details look like. And you could take a Fourier transformation of a person and then separate that in lots of resolution rings. And by adding all these rings together, you would get the full Fourier transformation. Or by adding all these pictures together, you would get the full picture back. And 2DX at one uh, step in, uh, in a script that makes the maps in the end, goes to the Fourier transformation and evaluates the, um, this, the resolution in different resolution ranges. And it does that by going for smaller rings, intermediate and high resolution rings, and evaluates the Fourier transformations only in those between those radii. So for our 2D crystals, this is how the normal Fourier transformation would look like out to high resolution. And if you now blur the picture in Photoshop, then the high resolution is gone. Yeah, so if you see a Fourier transformation like this, and there is just nothing, um, then you know, whatever I do, I will not get higher resolution than how to where my Fourier transformation shows me details. Um, sometimes you can still save a little bit of resolution. So this blackboard is something to get used to. So if you have a um, if you have a signal that is a, a low resolution structure with a little bit of high resolution detail. Okay. And if you go to Fourier space, then the Fourier space would show you the low resolution peak, very strong, plus the high resolution peak, very weak. Um, so this would be the Fourier transformation, and this is the frequency space. Right? And this is the real space, and this is the normal gray value. Now, if we know that um, our microscope is bad and usually records um, low resolution stuff okay, but the high resolution stuff is actually bad, um, what we could do is um, we could make the high resolution stuff higher. It's saying, I know that this is an artifact of my microscope. I want the same 100% sensitivity for all frequencies, so I just multiply this up. And you could transform this into something where you say, you know, the low frequency was recorded okay, but the high frequency should be at least, should be also this high. Yeah. Um, you could do this in the computer now, by just multiplying these higher frequencies in the Fourier transformation with a certain correction factor. 
And then we can go back to the real space with the inverse Fourier transformation. And then our structure would look like, like it should look like. Yeah? So for example, like this. So this is now the correction of a, an envelope here. This is what a good listening device should do. Yeah? So if you are 80 years old and your ear loses the high frequencies, you shouldn't just hear everything louder because then your, your drum would explode. But the, what the problem mostly is, is the high frequencies. And you should have a good listening device that should have a microphone, do a Fourier transformation, only amplify the high frequencies, but not the low ones. And put this one on the loudspeaker so that you hear correctly. So that would be a nice listening device. And this is what we could also do with a computer. And we will deal with that tomorrow when we speak about CTF correction. Then our pictures usually, they don't look like this. The cryo-electromicrosis, this is the negative stain picture, for example. But the, the cryo-electromicrosis microscopy pictures rather look like this. So it's just covered with noise. And if we have a real picture like this covered with noise and we go to Fourier space, it's also covered with noise. So now the question is, what, what can we do there? So... We now have this situation, we have a noisy picture. We go to Fourier space and it's all covered with noise. Since this, this noise is from Photoshop, um, also in Fourier space the noise goes out to the very edge here. So out to the very edge. But in, if this were a real electromicroscopy picture, then the noise would only go to a certain radius, which is the highest resolution that your microscope can record. So how can we still determine the high resolution protein structure from this thing? This is what we do with image processing, what the whole workshop is about. Um, we can still recognize the spots, especially the computer can, can see the spots here. Yeah, they are hidden in the noise, but we can see them. We may not be able to find the protein in this picture by the naked eye, but we can see the spots by the naked eye. So we have them here. You can say, well, it's noisy, but at least I see this one, and I see that one, and I see this one, and I see this one. And so what we do is we find them, and it's even easy because they are all on a regular lattice. As long as you find two, you have them all. Then we define a mask, and we say we keep these within the mask, um, these here, these spots, we keep those, and the rest we set to zero. And then we do the inverse Fourier transformation, and then our picture is free of noise. It's the same picture as before, but the noise is gone. And because the noise is everywhere, and the noise is also a little bit within the mask, a little bit of the noise is, if the mask is wider, is also in here, and so a little bit of noise we will have to keep, unfortunately, and so there are some variations of noise in this. Yeah. And the more narrow we can make the mask, the better we can filter out the noise. And so if the original crystal is perfectly ordered, then we have perfectly sharp spots, and then we can make the mask really nicely sharp, and then we eliminate in one go all the noise, and then we have this. So that's the concept or the idea that Richard Henderson implemented in the MRC programs in the 70s. And I think Nigel Anvin recorded the pictures of frozen high-graded bacterial rhodopsine, and the beginning it was glucose embedded, and Richard Henderson realized that actually it's a crystal, so maybe you could do this buoy filtering. He implemented this in the Fortran programs, 1970 or so, and that's the basis or the birth of electron crystallography. This is called Fourier filtration. So then some mathematical torture stuff um, for Fourier transformations. <coughs> so this is this equation. This is our image function, and it's multiplied with this exponential of an imaginary function. Um, and after we integrate over the entire image, um, we get our Fourier transformation. This exponential is a cosinus of this stuff minus i times sinus. So our Fourier transformation initially here 
gives us a cosinus and a sinus term. But nobody wants to look at the cosinus and sinus term. What we want to look at is at the amplitude of a certain frequency u and the phase of a frequency u. And so um, every display function of a Fourier transformation usually would show you as the amplitude <coughs> just the modulus of um, the cosinus and sinus terms <coughs> by um, just, um, what is it, sparing them, summing them up, and taking the square root of that. That's the amplitude. And then if you really want, it could also display you the, the phase, and the phase is the arcos tangens of the ratio between the two of them. Okay. So that's what you usually display. And this is called the Fourier transformation of your function f, and it's called capital F. And there's also the inverse Fourier transformation that goes back, which is this Ft minus 1, which mathematically is the very similar formula. The only difference is that here we have a minus i and here we have a plus i. Okay. Now, um, Fourier transformations are nowadays implemented on the graphics card. You have your image, you push it into the graphics card, you press the FFT button, fast Fourier transformation FFT, and then it comes back as Fourier transform. And it's so fast that in the if you do an estimation how, um, how much computing processing you will need for any algorithm, you can usually ignore the, F, the Fourier transform because this goes so rapidly. It's hardware implemented sometimes. Um, a very fast implementation is also the FFTW library, which is called the fastest Fourier transformation in the world or in the West. In the West, in the West yeah. But nowadays it should be in the world yeah, because <laughs> West and East is, is gone. It's called war. In Berlin was a supermarket that's called the KDW, that's uh, um, Kaufhaus des Westens, this is the supermarket of the West. And when the wall came down and all East and West was now in peace and harmony, now they, they renamed it and it's called uh, Kaufhaus der Weltmarken, yeah, which is a uh, supermarket of the world. So, and FFTW should also, I think, be super. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, they have a different um, convention of where is the minus and where is the plus than Richard Henderson. And Richard Henderson implemented this. I think he did the minus for the forward Fourier transformation and the plus for the backward Fourier transformation. And FFTW has the opposite. And when in 2DX we replaced Richard Henderson's Fourier transformation with FFTW, initially um, uh, we got this wrong. And if you Fourier transform an image and go back to real space, then suddenly the, um, the image is flipped. Or if you, if you go in one direction with Henderson's and in the other direction, what is it? Yeah, so then the image is flipped. Because the sinus parts have the wrong sign and the cosinus, cosinus parts are still the same. And so in 2DX uh, we have an FFTW implementation where then after applying, applying FFTW we uh, correct we complex conjugate the Fourier transformations to be in agreement with the MRC conventions again. Um, but the formulas are otherwise very the same. Um, and it's historic. I think Henderson was before CC4 or before FFTW. So some rules about the Fourier transformation. It's, uh, it's linear if you increase the contrast of your picture by a factor A. So you make your contrast two times stronger by making this louder or stronger. Then also the Fourier transformation gets stronger by the same factor A. Yeah. Um, if you add two Fourier transform two images together, yeah. So this plus that, for example, that's the same as adding their two Fourier transformations together. This plus that. So this plus that gives us this picture, and this Fourier transformation plus this Fourier transformation gives us this Fourier transformation, which has four spots instead of two and two. Okay? So adding images is, and then Fourier transforming the result is like adding their Fourier transformations. G is the Fourier transformation of G, and F is the Fourier transformation of small f. Um, there is this reciprocity thing. If you scale an image by, by um, zooming in by a factor of a, that is like shrinking your Fourier transformation by the same factor of a. Yeah, if you increase the magnification, you decrease the scale in Fourier space by the same factor of a. And this is also why the Fourier space is called the reciprocal space, because it's all reciprocal. 
And if you rotate your picture in the laser diffractometer, for example, then you also rotate your poly space by the same rotation. <coughs> then um, the reason why we go to poly space and we like that so much is um, the convolution and cross correlation calculation. Um, convolution is when you have your image and you convolute that with some other function, g. Um, that is when you have a set, so um, so convolution is we have one picture called f that shows four spots and we have one picture called G that shows a smiley. Then the convolution of these two pictures is um, four smileys. Then that's convolution. Uh, what can also happen is we have our crystal atomic structure in the microscope, physical thing, and we take a picture, and the picture is unfortunately convoluting our crystal with a point spread function of the microscope. Instead of picturing an, dot, an atom as a dot, the microscope makes a smiley artifact for every dot, which is called the point spread function. And then this is our picture, and instead of seeing atoms, we see smileys, yeah, or point spread functions. And now, um, in Fourier space, in Fourier space, this, this can be calculate very rapidly by going to Fourier space and then we have the big Fourier transformation F and we have the big Fourier transformation G and if we just simply multiply them then we get the Fourier transformation of F times G and if we go back to real space we have this. So if you ask the, com the computer, and this is one megabyte, a thousand by a thousand pixels, to convolute this with that then the computer would have to take the smiley and shift it all over the picture and multiply this with the gray value here to produce this. And if this is one million pixels, if this is one million pixels, so 10 to the six, and 10 to the six pixels, then you would need 10 to the six uh, shifts and then 10 to the six multiplications, and that's 10 to the 12 um, multiplication steps. Whereas if you go into Fourier space and you say this is a hardware step, doesn't take us any time, then you have one megabyte here, which you have to multiply with one megabyte here, and that is 10 to the six multiplications when you are here. And then you go back, hardware, no time, and then you have in 10 to the six multiplications the same result. So this is, with a small picture, already a million times faster than if you would not use Fourier transformations. Yeah? So you save a factor of a million, but only this small picture if you go through Fourier space instead of doing it in real space. And that means convolution you would always explain in real space with smileys, but the computer would never do this. It would always go to Fourier space. And the other thing is the cross correlation. And the cross correlation, which one is it? The cross correlation is the very similar equation for the computer. Um, a small um, image f cross correlated with a search pattern g um, can also be calculated in Fourier space by taking their two Fourier transformations and multiplying them. But the difference is that one of them is now complex conjugated, which means the imaginary parts are added by 180 degrees. And then the result is back transformed and you have the cross correlation. And that's again a million times faster, similar to here. So you have your two functions, you go to Fourier space, you multiply them together, but one of them has to be complex conjugated, then you go back. And the cross correlation is used to find a search pattern in a picture. So if you have here a picture with viruses, but they are hidden in the noise, and you have one virus example, okay, so you have your viruses hidden in the noise, it's all full of noise, and you have one virus example. And you want to find all the viruses in the noise. You do the cross correlation, and the result is a map 
It shows you here, there, there, and there is your virus. And that's the cross-correlation map. And then you do a peak search and you have all your particles. You will need this if you want to find membrane proteins in the badly ordered crystals. We need a cross-correlation between our noisy picture and a reference. And the cross-correlation you can do in real space by just shifting it and multiplying and calculating similarity difference between pixels and so takes forever, takes 10 to the 12 multiplication steps, or you do it in Fourier space, which is what is implemented in the MRC functions, then it's much faster. And in order to calculate the cross-correlation between your noisy picture and the reference, you bring both to Fourier space, you complex conjugate one of them, you multiply them together once, the function twofold, or yeah, and then you go back to real space and you have your cross-correlation. So these two things are the main reason why we use Fourier space. Then for us, if we record pictures, we can also interpret artifacts in the microscope. So this picture is smeared out, but you don't know, is this what the protein looks like, the little lines here, or was there a problem of the microscope? And if you go to Fourier space, you see immediately that you have high resolution diffraction along this direction, but nothing there probably because the sample was drifting or because you had a beam-induced resolution loss on a tilted sample that had a drum, drum effect movement. Then this Fourier transformation shows you immediately in this, in this direction my resolution is 8, 4, 2, 1 nanometer resolution, but in this direction my resolution is 8 nanometer and then 4, 2, 1 is nothing. Yes, so one glance at the Fourier transformation shows you this has a resolution problem that is anisotropic. This here is a funny artifact. Yeah? Um, you have some overlaid stripe pattern over your Fourier transformation of absences. And what happened here is that this image, while it was a one second exposure time, after half a second somebody kicked the microscope and the sample jumped. So half a second this was exposed on the left and the other half on the right. It's a double exposure. Somebody slammed the door So while you took the image. And then your Fourier transformation shows these absence lines. Um, and you can use this um, convolution here uh, theorem to explain what happened here. So this is a point spread function that is two dots and the Fourier transformation of the two dots is a line pattern. And this Fourier transformation with all the stars was multiplied with a nine line pattern so that you have these absences. Then for 3D reconstruction, we need the central section theorem. And this is my last slide. Usually your Fourier space in 3D of your protein structure. So in real space, we have a protein that has X, Y, and Z coordinates, which is your protein. Yeah, so X, Y, and Z coordinates. And the 3D Fourier space has U, V, and W dimensions. U, frequency in U, frequency in V, and frequency in W. And this is our Fourier space that we will deal with. Um, and now if we take a picture of um, a picture of our structure, then we, the electron beam goes through the crystal and produces the projection map. And the projection map is an integral of the structure in the z direction. Yeah? So it's all summed up. All the gray values here are summed up and result in this gray value here. That's an integration over the vertical direction in mathematical description. And this picture here, Fourier transformed, is exactly the central horizontal section of Fourier space, this gray surface here in our Fourier space, yeah? which means of the Fourier space in U and V and W direction, the W equals zero plane. It's the central section that corresponds to the Fourier transformation of this projection picture. Okay. This is something we will use for the 3D reconstruction we have our crystal, we take pictures, and these pictures we can put into Fourier space to populate this Fourier space with measurements. And when we have measured all pixels in the Fourier space, we go back to real space and have a 3D reconstruction. That's the back projection thing. And we have five days, four or five days to learn this. If you are, if this is new for you, don't be shocked. Yeah? This is uh, in one hour the summary of what will come in the next four days. Yeah. But just to show you that the Fourier space will be needed. Um, 
summary. Fourier space is a mathematical, or Fourier transformation is a ma mathematical equation. We can immediately see what the microscope is doing, the performance of the microscope. We can see what the resolution or quality of the image is, how far out goes the noise of our structure. Um, we can correct certain artifacts of the microscope. We come to that tomorrow. Um, we can get the crystal structure with this Fourier filtering here, the noisy crystal. We can filter the noise away. Um, Fourier transformations are very handy to calculate the cross correlation or convolution because it's a million times faster or more, more. And we can also use the Fourier transformation to go from two-dimensional pictures to a 3D reconstruction. Yeah. So this comes later. And David de Rossier said uh, once in a nice talk, this slide here, um, he said, this is what you have and this is what you get. So you have in your Fourier transformation spot positions um, then he said, well, what you get is you get very excited because you have actually a crystal. So what you have is spots and what you get is excited. Um, in full, yeah. So, But then if you have the spot positions, that gives you the unit cell and the shape. Um, so the distance to the farthest spot in the Fourier transformation. This is the Fourier transformation of your picture. The furthest spot out there gives you the resolution. Yeah, the further out you have diffraction data, the higher resolu the resolution is. The amplitudes and phases of all these spots in the calculate Fourier transformation give you the structure of your protein. And the rest, we, we will speak about that tomorrow. So this is what I wanted to tell you for the Fourier space, Fourier transformation today. It's the worst of all the topics we deal with in this week. <laughs> yeah. So any questions to that? That's a good point. In single particle electron microscopy, when you have pictures of ribosomes, you want to all align them to the same origin and rotate them into the same direction and then average them. Right? In electron crystallography, we prefer doing to do things in Fourier space. And in Fourier space, you align things not by shifting pictures, but by changing phases in Fourier space. Yeah? And if you change the phase by 180 degrees, you shifted your unit cell by half a unit cell. And if you want to shift your unit cell only a little bit, you change your phase by 10 degrees. I'm speaking about the phase of the first order diffractions. If you change the first order by 10 degrees, that's, that means this first spot somewhere here, then you take, have to take the second spot and shift it by 20 and the third spot by 30 degrees. And if you do all that, is that correct? Yes, I think. Then you shift actually your picture. And um, aligning them all to a common reference means you set the phase origin, which is the phase of the first diffraction order, to a value so that they all are the same orientation, the unit cells. Any other questions? Yeah, but I think we, we should... The, the MRC software deals with these APH files, amplitudes and phases, and we should just double click on those, and then you see it's actually columns of amplitudes and columns of phases, and the phase values we will also discuss about which one is CPF corrected already or not yet or so. Yeah. But usually we only display amplitudes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We have this laser diffraction function in 2DX where you can only calculate the Fourier transformation of a little window within your crystal and you can check which 
crystal area shows the best diffraction. <coughs> I found this, so I, I was always puzzled by this um, kilobyte thing. So if you have a thousand by a thousand pixels, the picture is a megabyte, but the Fourier transformation is 2.1 megabyte because you have 1025 by 1025. And I, I try to ask different people why is this so much more space. Yeah? I could imagine that you only need to store half of it, but it's still more than 500. This is 513, and this is 512. Yeah. So where does this additional kilobyte information end up? Yeah? And David de Rousseau was immediately capable of explaining me that the last row has to be real, and that's the entropy information that you have to store here. I found that interesting. I found that funny. Yeah, so there's this computer information theory. How many kilobytes do you need to store a certain information content? Yeah, and it should be if this is the equivalent, it should be the same here and the same there. Yeah. I found that funny that David de Rossier, he's like 80 years old, so he just said, "Oh, of course, it's trivial." <laughs> so. Yeah, so we, we will do both. We look at the real space images and see if they are nicely aligned. And we can also look at Fourier space values and see if they agree. But if you have a strong reflection that is different by 180 degrees, then you know that one is wrong CTF corrected. We will look at both. Yeah, I think that's it for, for now. 